कभी करती है मुलाकातें कभी करती है मुलाकातें कभी यादों में बरसाते किताबें करती हैं बातें किताबें करती हैं बातें मन की गहरी झील में कूद जाती हैं कभी सोच के दरिया के संग संग बहती जाती हैं कभी चाहे शाम हो या हो रातें किताबें करती हैं बातें Hello and welcome to Kitab Nama Books and Beyond. Uh, today we are in conversation with Ali Kobri Ekerman, the Aboriginal writer from Australia. Uh, and her new book is just out in India. And uh, so my first question is, what made you write this memoir? I wasn't allowed to grow up with my family. And this is sort of the starting point of the book. It's the voice of a young girl who's uh, growing up on a farm with a German Lutheran family. Um, life isn't kind and s slowly she uh, is feeling that she's not fitting into the society where she's living and that increases in the second part of the book which is the teenage uh, girl who encounters racism for the first time at school and again the world becomes more crueler and she feels like she doesn't fit into society. Then the third voice is uh, in her 20s. She's not allowed to keep her firstborn child and collapses into a world really um, influenced by drugs and alcohol. The fourth part of the book is the recovery of finding her birth family, finding her culture, returning to the desert and rebuilding her life. And um, it's a really important story in Australia, not just as my own, but for nearly every Aboriginal woman my age um, in Australia. Yeah, uh, especially in the context of Australia and the Bringing Home report, where you have histories of uh, one in ten to three in ten Aboriginal children being taken away from their families, and it's it's very traumatic his, history, and it's also about a lot of painful customs and things that you go through, like uh, child sexual abuse or domestic violence, and these are things that are stigmatized everywhere, including in India, and so. What made you come out and break this taboo and write about it and speak about it? At the time when I wrote the memoir, I was living at Tichikala on the edge of the Simpson Desert. So after that long journey, here I was back on country, living with traditional family um, and living on community. And so I had this safety net around me for, for the first time in my life. And the story came out. It was quite a cathartic process. And probably because of that safety net, I felt secure to share the things that I'd been taught to be ashamed of in my life, yes. like the child sexual abuse. It was also around the time when the government was saying that child sexual abuse is prevalent in Aboriginal communities and almost suggesting that it doesn't happen mainstream. So I have to use literature as a bit of a protest and a bit of an equivalator against statements like that because the government's not saying things quite true. Yeah. They trick English, they use tricky English and people think, oh, the Aboriginal community, it's in a crisis. Mm -hmm. And sure, we know our crisis, we live within that community. Yeah. They never really promote the blessings and the beauty. Of the community. Yeah, of the community. Uh, Ali, you, I'm very happy that you mentioned this concept of tricky language, especially when you are talking about the state uh, and the way in which uh, they are trying to say these lies about your culture. So when you're talking about this, I find that your memoir doesn't have any embellishment. The prose is very sharp, hard-hitting and blunt, and it speaks the truth as it is. Uh, so how did, you, uh, how, how did you manage to do this distilled language? How did you arrive at it? You know, there's a few factors. Mm -hmm. I was educated and living in a family and a society mm -hmm. that wasn't my own. So um, English was my favourite subject all through school. Mm -hmm. And I read many books. 
so I know how words work if, if I could be so bold. Then going back to community, and there's an Aboriginal language, but there's also uh, the traditional language. But more importantly, there is the language from the earth. And somehow all that combined into the way that I write. I love being a, min um, a minimalist writer. I love getting away with all the icing and just having the cake. Because the icing, I think, is very dangerous if I can use that metaphor. There's also another thing out um, in culture that if you're egotistical and talk too much about yourself, it's the first sign of um, uh, mental illness. Ra, 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 ra. And so getting rid of all the ra, ra and just getting to the fact, as is my truth, I'm saying this is my truth, um, as I lived it, is that, is that sparring truth. Uh, you're also a poet and uh, it's not only this memoir that you have written but you've also written a book called Ruby Moonlight in which you write about the history of uh, colonization and you've written it as a verse novel and there's so much of poetry that keeps coming in this book. So how did you use this form of poetry within your work and how relevant is poetry to what you're doing? You know, I'd like to think that I can retain some enjoyment in writing poetry. <laughs> Maybe I write about um, really hard subjects, but most of my life was pretty hard and I was clamouring from, from one place to the next for survival and I'm really, really blessed that I survived long enough to find my mother and four years later to find my son. That's my biggest blessing. And, um, and so there's a, I, I, you know, I learnt some survival skills. I can write about the, the hard subjects because we need to bring that dialogue back to mainstream Australia and say we haven't resolved this. People are really hurting from this on both sides. Yeah. We need to have another dialogue. They go, oh, we forgot that history has emotion. I said, well, we never did. When we're sitting around the campfires, we, we were always talking about historical fact and it has emotion. You spoke about the idea of a history that's a separate from emotion that's being bandied around. But in terms of what you have written, especially given Australia's current history where even the word Aboriginal or Indigenous is not recognised or used in the Australian constitution, uh, which is very glaring. And uh, coming from India, we also have a country of uh, multiple um, differences, but also histories of oppression. Uh, how do you think that communities can respond both in terms of you know taking over the cultural space or the artistic space to tell these stories that have never been told because it challenges power structures. Yeah, you know, I think the world is beginning to know that Aboriginal and um, uh, Islander people aren't included in Australia's constitution in 2015. And it fascinates me that the Australian government isn't rolling over with embarrassment, at least embarrassment, yeah. or shame of that fact, and forcing the nation to go to a referendum to decide whether we should do that or not. If they were a heartfelt uh, government, surely they can do it, do it and, and, and offer it. Um, and, um, but Aboriginal people have and I think uh, it's with Indigenous people all around the world. We almost have like a survival humour. Mm -hmm. And so there's different reactions in reading my writing from Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. The Aboriginal people get the humour. The non-Aboriginal people are saying, this is not funny. And I think that's, that's a really important part of the survival, that the humour blocks the hurt entirely. Mm -hmm. And in the privacy of our campfires or in our houses or when the government cars have all driven away from, from their bossiness of, uh, of, of overseeing. overseeing the communities. There's much laughter and pantomime. Now this is an ancient art form that's, that's, that's come through. And um, you know, taking the mickey as we, as, is, a, is a bit of a term. So laughing at, at what's confronting lessens it a little bit and maybe allows you to sleep better at night.
how how important was this uh, survive, going back into community uh, as your growth as a writer, for instance? I think the way you say a story is not the way I've seen many stories told. You know, so how does it work, or mm -hmm. were you influenced by the kind of things that you had to share with your community? You know, for me, for especially in terms of healing, because yeah, yeah. Well, it was a profound healing. For most of my life, I was pretty unhappy and um, bordering on violent. I was so unhappy and I could hide that with the alcohol and the drugs and then I could be, pretend to be the happy person. In the first part when I wrote as the voice of a young girl, the damage that occurred there prevented me from crying and I worked out later that I hadn't been able to cry for 27 years despite car accidents and losing my son and all these occurrences. When I found my traditional family out in the desert, the Yankadara Pitandara people, we still have traditional healers. They're called Nunkari. Now the Nunkari have immense powers and they recognised me as quite a damaged child, even though I was in my mid-30s. Here was a damaged child coming back out into the desert and they did a lot of healing with me. And after a while, they took the damage away and the tears flowed. So I cried for three years. It was a very, very emotional time. And at the end of that big waterfall came the book. So it was a book of healing it was definitely a book of celebration. Uh, this is a personal journey, but your other writing, for instance, deals with the history of colonization of Australia, about the injustice that has been meted out. Uh, instead of uh, you know, just making a political statement, how important was it for you to trace the history of the indigenous people and to put it out there for the world to see? And as you say, shame the Australian government and the state structure. Well. In the introduction, the book uh, says it's written without blame. So it is factual. The British government did come and uh, test atomic bombs on our traditional land. My family was living out there and were affected by that. The atomic bombs, almost the ripple effect of that caused the removal of my mother, and then the removal of me from her, and then the removal of my son from me. There's no way to tiptoe around that. Um, the fight for land rights, the Anagul um, Pinjara, Yankamjara lands, the APY lands, was one of the first major sit downs of Aboriginal people saying, we want our land back. And one of the first major um, uh, land claims in South Australia. Again, that's my family. I think for me, the curiosity uh, was that when I had run away from my adopted family, I had been living at these places, not knowing that they, they belonged to my family, because in some places the land hadn't been returned to my family, and so there were empty places. I was working, making roads, and um, uh, just any job that I could get in a remote area. I loved the desert. There was something that the desert made me feel at home. Um, and uh, so it was quite the journey to go back again to places that I knew quite well, but this time to sit down with family. Ali, and my last question is that now you've been to India, you've had a couple of talks, you've been around the country. What do you think about our country? What do you think about India? What's your message to Indian people? You know, um, India is so vast and so rich and yet so complex. The, some of the friendships that we've made already almost feel like the lifelong friendships. I think there's quite often you run into the spirit of India and it reminds you of the spirit of Aboriginal Australia. And so the friendships are very fast tracked. Um, we've had a wonderful time in India. I look forward to coming back. I hope many um, readers get some healing or some personal reference out of the book. Uh, thank you, Ali, for joining us uh, on Kitab Nama and uh, thank you for your time and I hope that readers uh, pick up a copy of your book and uh, 
they read and enrich themselves and at least learn to speak up against all the taboos in our society as well. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Hindi Sahitya, खास तौर से उपन्यास विधा अपने आप में इतना संपन्न है और पिछले कुछ अरसे से जिस तरह से अस्मिता अस्मितावादी इस दौर में हिंदी उपन्यासों की चर्चा हो रही है उसी श्रृंखला में मेरा एक उपन्यास नरक मसीहा काफ़ी कहना चाहिए कि चर्चित भी रहा है और पाठकों का भरपूर प्यार भी मिला है नरक मसीहा दरअसल भारत में तेज़ी से पनपती एन संस्कृति स्टेट कॉरपोरेट और सिविल सोसाइटी के गठजोड़ का पर्दाफाश करती एक ऐसी कृति है जो संभव थे एन संस्कृति को केंद्र में रखकर लिखी गई कोई रचना है तो मित्रों मैं अपने चौथे उपन्यास नरक मसीहा का एक अंश मैं आपके सामने प्रस्तुत करता हूं। ये पहला अध्याय इस उपन्यास का है जिसके का मैं शुरुआती अंश यहाँ प्रस्तुत कर रहा हूँ ऐसी प्रचंड गर्मी गंगाधर आचार्य ने अपनी जिंदगी में कभी नहीं देखी मध्य जून के आग बरसते लू के थपेड़ों से झुलसे और पसीने से तर आचार्य जी के जिस्म को वातानुकूलित स्वागत कक्ष की ठंडक ने हल्के से दबोचा ही था कि किसी कार के रुकने और एकाएक बढ़ती गहमा गहनी मैंने उन्हें झिझोड़ कर जगा दिया बाहर अभी अभी आकर रुकी बगुले सी सफ़ेद अम्बेजर कार की ओर लपकते बदहवास चपरासियों स्वागत अधिकारी की मुस्तैदी और वहाँ पहले से बैठे आगंतुकों की भंगिमाओं मुद्राओं से आचार्य जी ने भाँप लिया कि जिसका इस प्रचंड गर्मी में पूरा पूरे स्वागत कक्ष को इंतज़ार था वह आ चुकी हैं एकाएक उनका हाथ सिर पर गया तो पाया उनकी दुपल्ली टोपी अपनी जगह पर नहीं है हड़बड़ाते हुए आचार्य जी ने नीचे सरक गई टोपी को उठाया और उसे उसकी जगह पर रख दिया पल भर के लिए गंगाधर आचार्य की आंखें धोखा खा गई इससे पहले कि वे स्मृतियों के पुराने रेखा चित्रों में रंग भर पाते स्वागत कक्ष का मुख्य द्वार खुला और सदी हुई पतचाप के साथ आंखों पर चढ़े कीमती काले चश्मे ने उनके पास आकर स्वागत किया नमस्कार आचार्य जी माफ करना आपको इंतजार करना पड़ा वो क्या है कि फ्लाइट लेट हो गई थी आइए गंगाधर आचार्य स्वागत कक्ष का मुख्य द्वार खुलते ही उसमें प्रवेश करते कीमती काले चश्मे के साथ विदेशी इत्र के भभूके के पीछे पीछे हो लिए विशाल कमरे में प्रवेश कर अपनी कुर्सी के ठीक ऊपर टंगी वर्तमान राष्ट्रपति प्रधानमंत्री और उन दोनों को मध्य स्निग्ध मुस्कान बिखेरती तस्वीरों को नमन कर काले चश्मे ने आचार्य जी को बैठने का आग्रह किया बैठते हुए आचार्य जी रह रह कर सोचते रहे कि उसके सामने बैठे इस काले चश्मे ने जो संभवतया किसी ने उपहार में दिया होगा दीवार पर टंगी इन तस्वीरों में से किसे नमन किया होगा बाई ओर टंगे राष्ट्रपति को दाई ओर लटके प्रधानमंत्री को या फिर इन दोनों के मध्य एक निश्चित दूरी पर स्निग्ध मुस्कान के साथ झूलते गांधी को सामने दीवार पर टंगे एल टीवी की विशाल स्क्रीन पर एक धार्मिक चैनल पर पहले से चल रहे किसी आध्यात्मिक गुरु के प्रवचनों की अनुगूंज से पढ़ने वाली बाधा को रिमोट से कम करते हुए काले चश्मे ठीक गांधी सी महीन मुस्कान उछालते हुए पूछा बताइए क्या लेंगे जी कुछ नहीं आज मेरा उपवास है गंगाधर आचार्य ने पूरी विनम्रता के साथ काले चश्मे के आग्रह को अस्वीकार करते हुए कहा तो क्या आपका वो साप्ताहिक उपवास वाला कर्म कर्म अभी भी जारी है आदत पड़ जो पड़ गई है बेहद भोलेपन के साथ कहा आचार्य जी ने ना बाबा मुझसे नहीं होता अब ये सब पता नहीं इस उम्र में भी आप कैसे कर लेते हैं चश्मों को आँखों से उतार टिश्यू पेपर से माथे की चिपचिप पहाट को पहुँचते हुए वापस चढ़ाते हुए बोला काला चश्मा बात आदत की भी नहीं है बहन जी संयम और अनुशासन की है आचार्य जी ऐसा भी क्या अनुशासन जिसे आदमी जिंदगी भर छाती से चिपकाए रखे इस बीच चपरासी जूस का गिलास रख गया लाइए पहले काम की बात कर लें जूस का लंबा घूंट भरते हुए बोला काला चश्मा गंगाधर आचार्य ने कंधे से लटके मोटे खादी से बने झोले को उतारा उसमें से कागजों का पुलिंदा निकाल यह कहते हुए आगे बढ़ा दिया 
आपने जैसा निर्देश दिया था वैसा ही बना कर लाया हूँ काले चश्मे ने जूस का पहले से लंबा घूंट मारा और उसे हल्के हल्के हलक से नीचे उतारते हुए होठों ही होठों में बुध बुदाया सर्वोदयी कल्याण सभा अचानक पलटते पन्नों को ठिटकता देख आचार्य जी असहज से हो उठे मेरा एक सुझाव है आचार्य जी वैसे जरूरी नहीं है कि आप इसे माने भी परंतु इस पर विचार जरूर करके देखना कि यह सर्वोदयी कल्याण सभा जैसा नाम अब बीते जमाने की बात नहीं हो गया क्या अगर सभा की जगह आश्रम होता तो क्या कहने गंगाधर आचार्य एक अजीब भूल भलैया में भटक गए नहीं समझ पाए सामने बैठे काले चश्मे का आशय और तात्पर्य दरअसल सेवा भाव या परोपकार का जो दर्शन इस आश्रम शब्द में आश्रम शब्द में निहित है वह तो सभा में नहीं है सभा से लगता है जैसे जमीन पर टाट पट्टी बिछाकर या कहीं खुले आकाश में जाजम बिछाकर भीड़ जुटा रहे हैं जबकि आश्रम में मानव गांधी का पूरा चिंतन समाया हुआ है कहते कहते बापू की तस्वीर के ठीक नीचे बैठा काला चश्मा गहरे चिंतन में डूब गया कुछ क्षणों के बाद वह वर्तमान में लौटा तो एक अकल्पनीय सुझाव के साथ वैसे एक सुझाव और भी है मेरा कि सभा या आश्रम की जगह ट्रस्ट अथवा फाउंडेशन की बात तो कुछ और ही है वह भी किसी बड़े नाम के साथ सबसे बड़ा फायदा ट्रस्ट या फाउंडेशन का यह होता है कि विदेशी अनुदान मिलने में बड़ी सुविधा होती है